Bungalow Bill here, and now time for a building episode. So first off, I'm putting some materials on some material storage onto this building platform because I'm building a railgun, and that means that I need it to have ammo storage, I need it to have battery storage, I need to have fuel storage so that I can fill up the battery storage, that kind of thing. In particular, I'm building a railgun because I'm going to be up against the Grey Talons and the Scarlet Dawn, and I have armor that's made out of paper. It is paper, you know, before it's been pulped and milled, but still paper nonetheless. And I need to throw really big shells and do a lot of damage and knock things out really fast. That's something that uh, has come to mind here is that I believe when I built this shell, I forgot to put a base bleeder on it, uh, which I particularly want. Now that I've already built the turret, it will not go so well with my recoil absorption. I might be able to find enough room on it to put a little bit more recoil, recoil absorption off to test one or the other. If I can't make that work, I'll put a super cavitation base on it or something, but there should be one of those two things on there. And the next thing that I'm doing is I'm building a turret ring, if memory serves. This is 13 by 13. Uh, it, it takes me a few attempts. I was not exactly on top of my game here. So I realized that my turret ring is not matching up, and it's because I went one block too far there. I might actually mess this up two different times. It, it's a little bit embarrassing. Uh, eventually I figure everything out, and this is what a turret ring looks like for 13 by 13. And uh, afterwards, one level down, I build the turret well under it. Despite the fact that um, this turret might just have square turret wells in the craft, or ones that are slightly bigger than this, it doesn't, doesn't really matter all that much. So the, the other thing is that I don't armor this turret while I'm building it. Usually once I get up to around these turret sizes on large vehicles, I start to put heavy armor half shields in front of the turret and metal armor half shields on the behind the back of the turret so that it'll face the heavy armor towards the enemy you can see it jump cut a little bit darker because i was in combat there however the only armor that i have to work with is wood so i don't even bother i'm making a two barrel turret so i have the sectioned off for rotational symmetry um i do a few stupid things not leaving enough room for myself on the bottom for an ammo ejector turret so no, a little a little scatterbrained i know but uh, the, the turret eventually does come out okay and it really doesn't take me all too long so i move it up so that there's room for my ammo input feeders which i eventually put in the right places as well as an ammo ejector throw the ammo ejector on uh, throw a few ammo inputs on the top and i do take the ammo oh and this is all being built on the main construct not the sub construct so i knock it all off and start over again uh, yeah. So, anyway. Those, the ammo inputs on the top might not necessarily stay there. Once I pattern them out, I need to connect them all because I like to add the smallest number of layers on top as I possibly can. Although, I do have a little bit of extra room because I'm building this as a necklace turret. So, if I'm building a next turret and I have a lot of time, I like to add zero additional height over the autoloaders plus ammo input and have very little to no APS components sort of in the turret cap. Getting all of that just right and not having any dead space takes a lot of time. I don't have that kind of time here. And as a result, I'm going to have a small amount of dead space, not very much, but a small amount. And I'm building a necklace turret because it's faster and I'm really not going to see any disadvantages by using one here. So the other thing I'm doing is four clip Tetris. This will be fairly efficient and never mix the number of clips that you have. Some people who know better still do so, um, as, as I've seen looking at their builds recently or looking on YouTube, but it's not the end of the world if you do it. But you have since you have unequal firing cycles they don't quite match you get little stutters in your gun fire rates it's slightly suboptimal for me it's more of an aesthetic thing than an actual effect thing so here i am putting the railgun parts on it the shell that i have 
is going to be fired at 50,000 rail charge, so I put a total of 10 railgun magnets on it, and then get my gauge up to speed so that I can set it, set it here, get my shells loaded, and then once all that's done, I'm going to be able to start to look at the stats. And once I can look at the stats, I'll be able to figure out, okay, how much cooling do I need? How much charging do I need? How much recoil absorption? And since these things all have to be balanced, and really there just has to be a certain amount of it compared to the number of autoloaders that you have, it's just sort of a matter of playing around with it until you get something that works exactly. And if you're using a fixed number of clips per autoloader like I am, it's nearly inevitable that you're going to have some dead space depending on the number of barrels, the turret size, and whether or not you're allowing yourself to have additional layers over the autoloaders. So unless you do a lot of a lot of playing around with different turret sizes and that sort of thing, um, you'll probably have a little bit of dead space in it. Even some of my better turrets have a little bit. And I, you know, often just throw a little bit of extra stuff in it, whether it's material storage or some extra surge protectors around the sorts of places where EMP can actually leak in productively, which is usually just the turret cap itself. Just just that sort of that sort of thing, or Perhaps if I can, packing stuff more efficiently towards the back and just adding a little bit more armor to the front. There's a number of things you can do. In this case, I really, I need this gun and I need it now, right? So this is a style of building that is just working well enough. You can see that since I'm using 8 meter autoloaders and I'm putting in my recoil absorbers vertically because I don't want to stack the turret any higher than it specifically needs to be. I want my craft to be as thin as possible, height-wise. They don't go all the way to the bottom. At the front, I fill in that extra range with cooling vents. I realize that I have too much cooling. And replace some of those with railgun chargers. Doing the same thing in the back would add too many coolers. So uh, there's a variety of things that I can do if I want to sort of go towards a sort of Tetris as to make, perhaps reorganize things so that I have one channel around the bottom where I can connect everything, and then I can more efficiently pack magnets or railgun chargers into the bottom, and then free up more space sort of in the main cylinder for recoil absorption. Number of things to do to, to be more efficient, but... To, so... Um, I would attach things a little bit differently if I had access to armor that's not just wood because I would be focusing on using the exterior shell of armor that I build on the turret to attach the actual turret components to. Um, I fumble around here for a little bit, but basically what I'm doing is moving... So facing both my barrels the same way because with rotational symmetry one gun would point one way, one gun would point the other. Um, actually copying the recoil absorbers that I had to add onto the top because I didn't have room in the turret. And again, they don't actually really add any more room because I'm making a deck gun, or take up more space because I'm making a deck gun anyway. Although they do take up space that I could occupy with armor, that armor of course being, you know, all, all wood. So uh, for how useful that armor is, well, maybe these recoil absorbers would be, would be more useful for armor than the wood would be, but um, hard, hard to tell. So, anyway, I'm going to spin, spin one of these two guns around, make, it, make sure everything's even, make sure they're spaced out enough they can't be quite this close together. So, I'm tweaking the coolers so that they'll actually attach where I need the new guns to go. I also spent a little bit of time, because the, the first time that I patterned everything around 180 degrees, my recoiler, my cooling vents from the two guns were attached, so I repositioned them so that they wouldn't attach. You can see very briefly that they're aligned vertically on the sides rather than horizontally. I've been in a bit of a rush, so I sort of forgot to do that. There, there's a number of things you can do to occupy this bottom layer. Given that I usually have a shell of armor around a turret this size, I usually also put a layer of armor on the bottom. 
In this case, I could have done the, my turret geometry a little bit different just to put some of my turret bits a little bit lower because like this layer of wood under my turret isn't doing anything useful. It's just kind of there. Uh, but I wanted to fill up the space with something, so... So I threw something in. Now, the rest of this section is building the turret cap, which um, takes me a little bit longer than you think, and it's made out of poles, because of course it is. So... This turret cap is going to be incapable of tanking a very large shot, uh, but it should be able to take some small amounts of fire and leave the turret operational. At the beginning of the last episode, I showed a very short clip, uh, a very brief picture of the fifth season, a Onyx Watch fan build that I'm working on that has deck guns on it. Those things can take a pretty brutal amount of fire as long as it's frontal. The, vertically, their, their armor into the top leaves a little bit to be desired, so shooting down at one with a big rail gun, you could penetrate it pretty easily. But from the front, it can take penetrating rail shots from very powerful APS before it'll actually go through because it uses there's a lot of heavy armor that it has to go through as well as wedges and it's it's kind of a fun paradigm to have the super tanky super tanky deck gun of course when I just have wood well and this is not a deck gun it's a necklace turret but when I just have wood well it's not going to be that tanky it's partially laziness that drove me to do this but you know, I'm I'm hoping that this big block of wood will at least help this turret survive a little bit longer. And I think that there probably still aren't enough blocks here to pull in target clusters of blocks over the fuel engines that I'm going to be using. Uh, the fuel engine is the next thing that I'm going to be building. Because those are just very large clusters of blocks. And I'm going to need a lot of them. Um, I'm probably going to be using this on a battleship that has four of these turrets. I haven't checked how much they cost yet, I really should do that. I didn't do it because I can't save sub-objects in the campaign, so I'm going to have to spawn this vehicle in the designer mode to save the sub-construct, and then I'll actually know how much it costs. I, I don't want to, but I don't do any building in the designer mode, I just save the sub-constructs because I kind of have to. Um, a slight failure of editing on my part, but we are now into the fuel engine building portion. And so this is a 5x5 five five turbo engine. So, oh, it looks like I didn't edit this portion. Well, we're just gonna deal with it at this point. So this is one that I built myself, but I believe many other people have built an incredibly, incredibly similar engine. I've seen Dama using one, and he said that it came from um, a fuel engine pack on the Steam Workshop that he, along with others, worked on. It's called the Little Goliath, I believe, on that one. And there's a few ways to dress it up. So this is the sort of slightly more power dense and slightly more balanced against different RPM one, so that this will have very flat performance at different RPMs and make a total of 5,000 power. You can make a more fuel efficient version that only puts out 4000 power, but gets about 700 power per material at its max RPM, which is better than this does because I use a few non, um, non turboed carburetors. Basically at the corners of the cube, I have all of my turbos connecting and each one of those carburetors feeds three different cylinders. Now, I used the, the wrong turbos, so I'm going to uh, realize that once I have all of my piping here and I actually load the engine, and I'm going to replace them with the correct turbos. So I do think that this is kind of like, this is the, just the natural fuel engine to use for turbocharger engines. You know, you can, as I said, you can dress this up different ways. The one that I'm doing here is very good if you don't want to spend a lot of time optimizing power settings on your craft because it's fairly balanced. Basically at any RPM, it just gets like 600 power per materials and it's reasonably power dense. If you're going to optimize things a lot for the different engines to always, each engine to always run at maximum RPM, you can go for the pure turbo variant of this. 
Maybe and it'll get maybe thirty five power per volume instead of the forty of this. Uh, but it'll get the seven hundred power per materials. So yeah. Anyway, because basically turbochargers don't benefit very much from getting more exhaust gases input to them compared to like one exhaust gas is pretty much as good as maximum exhaust gases. It's very close. And each stage, this like the cylinders just don't produce enough exhaust gases to bother staging anymore. You get no benefit from it. Each stage of turbos will eat all of the exhaust gas from each stage of cylinders. So this is a one stage engine, the way it's set up. And you get no additional benefits from staging it because there's no additional exhaust pressure that this is not consuming. And the way that the, this Tetris gives you sort of like the maximum uh, three turbos per carburetor, three cylinders per carburetor, it does have a slight, slight Tetrising issue. As you can see, I'm sort of filling the center to the cube that doesn't work quite the same as everything else. But I do think it's kind of the natural fuel engine. You can do fuel engines that are just as good that have different Tetris that naturally extend longer. But the fact that this one, and this is when I realized I used the wrong turbos and have to re replace them. Uh, so but the fact that this one is a self-contained cube is really nice because you can just place a lot of these and if any of them take damage, all the other ones still work fine. So it's highly, highly redundant. I'm using something very similar in the fifth season. Uh, the one in the fifth season doesn't have the optimized piping that this one has where I replaced a lot of the sort of pipes with fuel boxes to increase the volume efficiency of it. And I'm running out of space in the fifth season, despite being such a large ship. I'm trying to keep the cost and volume like down a little bit. It's at 100,000 volume. So I'm going to replace all of its engines with um, this version taken from the Livewood, near, the Livewood Neater series of all things. But... Uh, maybe tweaked a little bit, but it, this is pretty pretty much the best you can do with the style of this engine. So anyway, I finished that up, and that's all for this episode. I do hope you've enjoyed watching, and I hope to see you in the future.